Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this third EatX webinar, which is part of a recently launched series of virtual presentations where EATRIS highlights translational topics, uh, its institutions, uh, its capacities and initiatives that are to the interest of the translational science community. Today's webinar is entitled Combining AI and Clinical Modalities and is the first of a trilogy hosted by EATRIS and co-organized with the Hybrid Consortium, uh, the ITN project that aims to advance imaging techniques and applications for personalized medicine. Um, before uh, we move on, maybe a few words about EATRIS. Uh, and EATRIS was introduced actually to the, the Hybrid uh, Consortium last year through one of our contacts in the Imaging Hub. Uh, so below in this slide, you see a few initiatives and there are many more initiatives where Iatris Eric is engaged in with, um, uh, within translational medicine with over 100 research institutions that are active in the five uh, scientific platforms. So what do we do? Um, Iatris provides access to research, uh, develops new translational tools and provides education and training with an overall mission to improve and support the translation of novel biomedical research outcomes into the clinic. And um, if you look at the, the number of imaging sites that are involved in, in the Atris, um, we have about 80, uh, 48 uh, centers in 10 countries. Uh, three of the hybrid consortium partners are engaged also within the Atris, that is uh, Groningen, uh, Paris, um, which we will hear today as well, and uh, the Technical University of Munich uh, who is participating in the EATRIS Plus project. Um, we're excited uh, about the trilogy uh, organized with Hybrid and to hear from experts showcasing how hybrid and molecular imaging can play an important role in personalized medicine. And we are looking forward to hear about the latest research outcomes also from the fellows involved in the initiative. Uh, so enjoy the session. Um, we would love to hear your feedback also afterwards. So please leave a comment in our channel. And I will now hand over to Thomas Bayer from the Medical University of Vienna as a scientific coordinator to int introduce uh, Hybrid and uh, the speakers. Thomas, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, allow me to introduce Hybrid very briefly to you. The, uh, these will be your speakers today. Um, certainly not all of them, but that's the consortium who we are proud to present through some of its research output today. And thank you for, to Iatris for giving us an opportunity to share some of the exciting results with you. What is hybrid? Well, it's 3.8 million euros uh, invested into 15 early stage researchers. Um, hybrid actually stands for healthcare yearns pardon me for the typo, for bright researchers of imaging data. And it really uh, brings together uh, experts from clinical research, healthcare industry, startups, as well as NGOs uh, in the realms of training and education, so as to pursue the use of molecular, anatomical, and more specifically hybrid, that is combined imaging, for the purpose of improving healthcare. Specifically, we set up this consortium in 2018, it's running for four years and coming to an end in November of this year, to advance the concept of personalized medicine uh, by means of extracting new information, potentially new biomarkers from bespoke molecular as well as hybrid image information. We uh, have three essential work packages and the ESR are assorted to those that deal with uh, data collection, also building cohorts, that deal with data processing, advanced data processing, also because we have, uh, we witness a growth in both the uh, dimensionality as well as the sheer amount of data collected as part of the uh, um, image acquisitions and clinical work of patients. And finally, a clinical translation, which means that we want to uh, test the biomarkers that we deduce through the use of radiomics, for example, from bespoke hybrid imaging and see how valuable are they in real clinical adoption. So the goal to summarize is really to put these expertises and the 
a willpower and manpower of these ESRs and their partners together to establish the field of non-invasive disease characterization beyond what we call a narrower vision of radiomics alone. Uh, it's really an exciting time. Martin said it in the sequel to this webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to draw your attention to three fabulous speakers, um, Irene Buvard, Nicolo Capobianco, and Esteban, um, um, sorry, Esteban, we only go by first name, Solari, from the Technical University of Munich. Um, Martin, if you'd like, I can introduce the first speaker, which would be Professor Irene Buva, and then we can hand over the mic, if that's okay. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the first speaker is uh, Professor Irene Buva, a long-term colleague and now mutual friend of mine who has been instrumental in uh, setting up this hybrid consortium and actually also in writing the grant and convincing the jury. Uh, Irene is currently the head of the lab of translational imaging and oncology at in Institut Curie Research uh, in Orsay near Paris. Some of you may know her as a true pet avid expert in the field. And uh, also lately, since a couple of years, she has been one of the pioneers of the LifeX software, which is an open access platform to do advanced and reproducible radiomics analysis. The topic of her presentation will really be on how we can use AI, both in the terms of its potentials uh, for advanced image analysis and personalized healthcare, but also she will shed some light on the challenges that we face in order to make it really a palatable and clinically translationable um, domain in addition to imaging alone. Without further ado, thank you very much, Irene, for joining and thank you for your time. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for the kind introductions, Thomas, and uh, good morning. Thanks for joining. And I'd like to, to start by thanking uh, Iatris for giving me this opportunity to briefly talk about the role that artificial intelligence might play in medical imaging and in hybrid imaging. That is when several uh, imaging modalities are acquired either simultaneously, as in PETMR, or almost simultaneously, as in PET CT. So, first, what can we expect from AI in hybrid imaging? There are three main situations in which uh, artificial intelligence could actually help. First, it can be used to enhance image quality or image precision. Second, Artificial intelligence can be used to accelerate image analysis and image interpretation, in particular by automating uh, certain steps. And third, it might even be able to help us discover new information somehow hidden in the images so that we could have, that we could have some significant prognostic or predictive value. And in that sense, it might help us discover new image-based biomarkers. So let me now give a few examples to illustrate these three situations and comment on the associated challenges. So let's start with the enhancement of image quality. An example application is to produce PET images uh, with what I will call clinical PET image quality from low stat images. And by training a, a neural network by many low stat, high stat image pairs, the network will learn sort of an adaptive filter uh, that can account for anatomical priors if we give the CT or the MR during the training. And, and that automated uh, filter will convert low stat images into high quality images. And this can actually have many impactful implications in the clinics, such as the reduction in acquisition duration which is always good to reduce patient motion, for instance. 
It could be also helpful to reduce the dose injected to the patient, which is nice for pediatric applications, for instance, or if we keep the same scan duration and the same dose, it might enhance image quality. And a nice asset of this application is that it does not require any image annotation. And image annotation is often the roadblock in this machine learning algorithm. But for doing that, we do not need any annotation of the images. We just need couples of high stat, low stat image pairs. And there are actually many other situations in which AI will be able to enhance image quality. Convolutional neural network can be used to enhance image reconstruction, and this is true in PET, but also in MR, for instance. And uh, it can also be used to improve or automate scatter correction at in, uh, in, in CT or in PET or in SPECT, attenuation correction in nuclear medicine imaging, motion correction, whatever the imaging modality, or it can be used to correct artifacts in any kind of medical images. And this is an elegant example where a convolutional neural network denoising was actually used to make it possible to correct for motion. Uh, in this dynamic acquisition, you can see that the authors used very short frames, and obviously there is no way you can estimate the motion between frames when the images are so noisy. But if we denoise the images using uh, uh, here a cycle GAN, then you start seeing the details in the images and these images make it possible to estimate the inter-frame motion. And this has been nicely demonstrated by the team of Thomas that by using this denoising approach, you can realign and, and correct for motion all time frames of these dynamic series so that you can then extract sound kinetic parameters. So AI will definitely help us get images with enhanced quality or with the same quality uh, as the one we have now, but using shorter scan or lower dose scan. And the main challenge here is to make sure that the AI generated images still include the specific features of the patient and that the, the processing does not erase any patient specific abnormalities. But we can expect that soon users will not even be aware of the fact that the images are produced using AI algorithm. And an important implication of this image enhancement is that it may further uh, broaden the range of applications that will be dealt with using hybrid imaging uh, to non-life-threatening disease, especially for CT and nuclear, me nuclear medicine uh, modalities that implies uh, uh, radiations. And if we can reduce the dose uh, a lot, we will be able to use these hybrid imaging modalities in uh, much, uh, in many more uh, disease than uh, what is currently uh, performed. The second situation for which AI will help uh, in hybrid imaging is to assist in image analysis both visual image analysis and quantitative image analysis. And here is an example developed within the hybrid consortium by David Wallis, where a convolutional neural network can help detect mediastinal uh, cancer nodes in non-small cell lung cancer patients. 
So here, the model was trained first to detect the suspicious regions in the mediastinum that could contain a node, and then each of these suspicious uh, regions were analyzed by a convolutional neural network to determine whether there was a cancer node or not in the cube. And here, of course, it's very difficult to know the truth because there is no way we can get a biopsy of each possible node. So we have to use an expert as the ground truth. And you can see that when comparing the AI-based model to the expert, the performance of the model uh, is at least as good as, if not superior than, the one we obtain when we compare a second expert to the one that is used to produce the ground truth. Here, another example where AI can be used to assist quantification. And I will go fast on this one because uh, Nicolo will also mention it. Here, the goal is to estimate the total metabolically active tumor volume in patients. We know that this total tumor volume has a high prognostic value, as you can see here. But in practice, it is not used because you can easily understand that it is very tedious to delineate all these many lesions, even when using a semi-automated process. But a convolutional net neural network can be designed so as to be able to estimate where the pathological lesions are within all the high uptake regions. And by summing the volumes of all the yellow lesions, you can get an estimate of the total tumor volume. And it can be nicely demonstrated that this estimate has a very similar prognostic value as the estimate we get from the manual uh, lesion contouring. So in short, uh, AI will considerably reduce the disparities in visual and quantitative image analysis expertise between centers. And thanks to the AI algorithm, all centers will become expert centers, even if they do not uh, have many patients suffering from a particular disease for which a specific uh, image analysis is needed. The main challenge here is to gather enough annotated data, including the technical and clinical variability that is encountered in the clinics to train the algorithm. But if we succeed in doing that, this will make quantitative imaging biomarkers become a clinical reality. And last, AI can be used as a discovery tool. Indeed, medical images contain far too much information comparing to what our brain can analyze. And this is especially true when dealing with whole body imaging, multi-modality images, and also when performing dynamic uh, imaging or when scanning a patient over time for longitudinal studies. And often we want to associate all the imaging data with other data such uh, as the omics data or the clinical data. And this is much more than what our brain can, can cope with. We know that we cannot see all wavelengths, that we cannot hear all frequencies. So we have to acknowledge that our brain cannot efficiently combine that huge amount of information. And we can rely on AI to find out the best combination of imaging data and non-imaging data that has significant prognostic or predictive value. And this has been nicely demonstrated in this paper where the authors could identify a combination of eight factors that when interpreted together 
made it possible to predict the survival at three years of patients with glioma. And again, you can easily understand that there was no way to find that combination of eight features without, without the help of a machine learning algorithm. So AI is absolutely needed to handle the complexity of imaging data, especially when we want to combine these imaging data with other omics or with clinical data. And here, the challenge is to find some easy ways to turn the AI models into new biological or medical knowledge. And this is still a challenge to overcome. But ultimately, AI will definitely contribute to new biological and medical discoveries. So in summary, AI can enhance image quality. It can facilitate qualitative and quantitative image interpretation and make it available in all imaging centers. And ultimately, it will help us discover new pathophysiological mechanisms through imaging. But we should always uh, re remind that AI is fed by data. So the data quantity, but also the quality of the data and the expertise we can bring together with the data remain essential for the success of these approaches. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And, we, and I will hand over the floor to Nicolo Capobianco for further insights into what AI can bring us uh, in the medical imaging and hybrid imaging field. Nicolo, the floor is yours. Irene, thank you very much for this very clear and unprecedented presentation. And Nicolo, I will not steal much time. Just to introduce you, you are one of the highest caliber ESRs uh, that we have the honor of hosting as part of Hybrid. Nicolo is Italian. He studied biomedical engineering at the Politecnico di Torino, and he has joined Hybrid um, a couple of years ago. He does his PhD with the Technical University of Munich, but he's employed by Siemens, which uh, sheds some light as to the opportunities we have with these ITNs where these ESRs are really anchored in both academia and industry. And part of the work that he's going to present to you about the clinical usefulness of AI in the context of hybrid imaging was really generated together with Irene Buvois when Nicolo visited her a couple of months ago. Thank you for joining and uh, best of luck. Thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure for me to speak today at this, uh, at this uh, webinar. I'm happy to talk today about um, um, imaging biomarkers in oncology and uh, recent uh, innovations and uh, research activities on uh, how artificial intelligence can be used to enable uh, these biomarkers. So imaging biomarkers are used in the routine management of cancer patients, and uh, it is really a broad concept. So according to uh, an FDA NIH working group, a biomarker is a defined characteristic uh, that, and that is an indicator of a normal or pathogenic uh, process or a response to an exposure or intervention. Biomarkers can be molecular, histologic, radiographic, or physiologic characteristics, and can be used for diagnosis, risk stratification, treatment planning, or treatment monitoring. In this talk, I'll focus on imaging biomarkers uh, and oncology. So typically defined characteristics uh, that are in use uh, to evaluate disease thanks to medical imaging. Um, Renowned examples are, for instance, the uh, clinical TNM stage, which can be used thanks to medical imaging um, for uh, risk certification and treatment planning. The left ventricular ejection fraction, um, a quantitative biomarker that is used to evaluate the cardiotoxicity of cancer treatments. 
And uh, for instance, the re resist uh, response assessment criteria, whereby exact measurements of uh, tumor sites are used to evaluate uh, the response uh, to a, a treatment um, for solid tumors. Imaging biomarker play an important role also in PET imaging, where uh, um, already some biomarkers are uh, quite established and used routinely in the interpretation of images. Um, here again, the clinical TNM stage uh, can be evaluated uh, thanks to molecular imaging. It's used for risk stratification and treatment planning. Uh, but physicians is also, have also come up to um, effective uh, criteria to evaluate uh, treatment response based on the images, such as the Duville score, which is used for uh, response assessment in lymphoma, and uh, the persist criteria, which is an, an adaptation of the resist criteria for evaluating response on solid tumors based on molecular imaging. But all these uh, biomarkers uh, typically focus on a subset of uh, representative lesions uh, to interpret the response to treatment, for instance, and are uh, typically a simple scoring system and categorical. Um, as Irene has mentioned uh, in her talk, uh, total tumor burden is emerging as a quantitative biomarker um, in a growing body of literature and has been shown to be a significant predictor of prognosis in a different uh, cancer types. Um, what is challenging uh, with this biomarker is, uh, is practical uh, measurement. It requires the delineation of all the sites suspicious for cancer, uh, which is typically a very time consuming task um, for the physician. It, it is then prone to error and operator dependent. Uh, so it's typically not practical to perform this uh, in the clinical routine. And it is a challenge for the adoption of uh, tumor burden as a clinical uh, biomarker. And here is a first uh, nice example where recent advances in computer vision uh, and uh, machine learning can enable um, an imaging biomarker. This is, uh, for instance, a recent study uh, which was conducted by researchers at Gintech and uh, Roche, where they trained a neural network on more than 2,000 PET-CT scans of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients. And they trained this network to delineate all the suspicious sites uh, uh, in, the, in a PET-CT scans for the whole body. So um, they tested this algorithm in an independent cohort of more than 1,000 uh, scans. And they found a very good uh, agreement uh, in the tumor contours between the ones de determined automatically and efficiently by the algorithm um, and the ones determined by uh, expert physicians. A different study, which uh, was conducted by researchers at Siemens Altenius and the University of Munster, um, used a, a neural network to classify all sites of uh, elevated uptake in uh, FTG PET-CT. This is a challenging task even for physicians since different processes can um, make the interpretation challenging uh, since uh, there can be uptake, for instance, in cases of infection, uh, inflammation. Um, so this this uh, um, study can show how artificial intelligence can be used to efficiently identify suspicious sites um, in the whole body pet CT. And uh, as Irene quickly mentioned already, then we conducted this study uh, collaborating with their group where we evaluated the previous algorithm in a large independent cohort of lymphoma patients. And we compare the results of this uh, automated algorithm using artificial intelligence um, with the manual expert annotation by physicians. And we show that uh, there is good agreement between 
the sites that are identified as uh, suspicious for cancer uh, between the algorithm and the expert. And we could uh, show that this, uh, um, this algorithm can be used to estimate uh, total metabolic tumor volume. Um, and this marker is, uh, was uh, shown to be a significant predictor of uh, overall survival and progression-free survival with a comparable prognostic value with the, with the one determined by experts. So, but in general, imaging biomarkers and tumor burden could play an important role in the future, uh, not only for FTG, but for uh, even different types of tracers. So in particular, in the recent years, different tracers uh, are in development uh, for oncology. And um, uh, imaging biomarkers and tumor burden could uh, uh, carry useful information uh, even for different disease types and different tracers used. For instance, in, in uh, PSMA ligand uh, PET-CT, already first studies show that the tumor burden um, is a significant uh, predictor of survival. One challenge is uh, now to transfer these uh, technologies uh, that can identify suspicious uptake sites to novel tracers. Um, so in a recent study, we uh, looked at the Gallium uh, 68 uh, PSMA-11. Um, it is used to evaluate the uh, prostate cancer. Um, and we show how the same uh, network structure can be adapted to evaluate uh, from FTG to uh, PSMA ligand PET-CT uh, to identify sites suspicious uh, for tumor presence in the whole body. We use the technique called transfer learning, which is very interesting because it allows to uh, transfer some of the information that was learned on a much larger uh, cohort of uh, FTG scans um, to a smaller cohort of PSMA studies, which we used for this application. Finally, not only tumor burden can be um, enabled by uh, artificial intelligence techniques, um, but we recently used uh, this uh, algorithm also to try to classify the anatomical uh, location of these suspicious sites uh, to characterize the, the spread pattern of the disease in the body. So by classifying the anatomical location of each uh, suspicious finding, uh, we show that it is possible to support also the staging uh, of the disease. Uh, and we have preliminary results where we show the uh, good agreement um, between the algorithm and the expert in uh, determining the, the, the nodal and metastatic stage for prostate cancer. So in conclusion, um, both solidly established uh, biomarkers and the emerging new ones are being used uh, to evaluate uh, uh, the disease in oncology. And uh, artificial intelligence can uh, support the efficient assessment of these biomarkers by enabling rapid measurements, uh, make them more robust and reduce the operator dependency. In particular, these uh, algorithms in general have shown uh, uh, high accuracy in, in processing multimodality and multidimensional data and to capture anatomical uh, physiological and uh, non-physiological patterns. So I believe these um, methods uh, in the future could, will be used to enable uh, already established biomarkers, but also to um, discover new ones. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nicolo, uh, for sharing these exciting results. I, I feel quite honored looking at, at your presentations to, to actually witness how much you deduced in the short time of the data you had at hand and the collaborations you engaged in. So thank you very much again. Our third and last speaker for this webinar is uh, Esteban Solari. 
And he's also one of the uh, more aspiring ESRs in the consortium who shares his time with us. Uh, Esteban did um, his, uh, he actually did two degrees, uh, one in biomedical engineering, one in medical physics in Argentina. He joined us in 2017. He works with the colleagues at the Technical University in Munich, where he also pursues his PhD. And he will finish off this series of this webinar, I'm sorry, with a more detailed perspective on the use of um, AI or sorry, machine learning to assess cancer aggressiveness. Thank you very much for your time. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Thomas. So as uh, Thomas already introduced me, I will not need to do that again, but I'm Esteban for the Friends in Hybrid or Esteban Solari, working in, technic in the Technical University of Munich. Um, and I'm going to talk about how uh, machine learning and deep learning in general can uh, help uh, prostate cancer station, in this case, aggressiveness. But also um, I want to show you exactly two um, examples, two droplets of water in this sea of uh, deep learning things that are happening and how uh, is it step-by-step uh, step, it's going to uh, stay, it's, it's here to stay. So my first, I want to show you the clinical problem here. Uh, when a cancer patient comes to the clinic, uh, is going to be uh, uh, taken by the doctor and the doctor will say, well, we need some images to confirm or not that you will have uh, prostate cancer. We are suspicious that you will have prostate cancer. So uh, if you're lucky enough and you come to the Technic University of Munich to the Reza ISA, uh, you will uh, find a PETMR machine that is a really high technology machine for imaging. Uh, and you will get two kinds of images. PET images and magnetic resonance images. Uh, these images are going to be used for different purposes, but one of, uh, two of the main purposes are first um, guiding the biopsy, and with the biopsy you will uh, know if you have or not cancer uh, at all. And then you will, with that biopsy, you will take the so-called Gleason score. This is a score that will uh, tell how aggressive the cancer uh, is or in which stage the cancer is. Uh, there's another score. This is a, a pirate, it's called pirates, and it's image based. So the difference here is that for the Gleason score, you need either a biopsy or a more uh, crude surgery operation that is called radical prostatectomy, where you get the, the entire prostate extracted. So it's really aggressive. And this pirate score, it's not diagnostic, but it will help you know the probability of, that you have or not cancer. So uh, the advantage of the pirate score is that it's only image based, so it's less invasive, uh, and it's based on magnetic resonance image. So we have this problem. Uh, we have the patient and we have the images, but what, what else can we say about uh, this first instance of the patient? Can we already predict if the patient will have a, a good outcome or a bad outcome? Can we already say something about the treatment that the patient needs to uh, undergo? So we uh, uh, go to AI or to deep learning and machine learning in this case, uh, to see if we can solve this, this small problem. Uh, in our setting, we normally will have three steps that can be uh, where deep learning and machine learning can be implemented in the segmentation step where you basically try to find the tumor or the organ and try to delineate it, to draw it in the images. Then a feature extraction where you try to uh, extract parameters, statistical parameters, that will uh, have some information about uh, the aggressiveness of the cancer in this case, and a classification step, where you say this has some degree of, of aggressiveness or, or this patient has or doesn't have cancer, for instance. Um, so first I want to show you this simple machine learning technique to predict tumor aggressiveness. Um, it's, it started as a collaboration with the University of Britain uh, under uh, Matthew Hutt, a great scientist, by the way. Um, and we started with these images, PET and MR images. And our question was, can we use PET plus MR images to predict biopsy results? Uh, as you remember, the PIRA score is based only on MR images, uh, but we have the power of the PET MR. So we wanted to see if there is another value in adding the, these PET images. So can deep learning or machine learning help us add uh, the value of these two kinds of images? Um, so we started with a simple approach. Uh, we did a semi-automatic segmentation. Uh, we did a hand-crafted radiomics. Those are statistical parameters that you take from the images. 
Uh, and then we trained a super vector machine. A super vector machine is a machine learning tool. And basically, you have to feed the, the machine uh, learning tool with a lot of uh, data from patients that already were um, um, already acquired the, this Gleason score. So you already, already know the Gleason score, uh, and you train the, this, this network. And when it's already trained, uh, you try to predict the results for patients that you didn't train the, the algorithm with. Uh, and with this really simple setting, uh, we got uh, uh, an accuracy of 82.5% in the prediction of Gleason scores, of, so in the prediction of aggressiveness of the prostate cancer. And this is really interesting because if the patient comes to the clinic, the first day that you do the images, you automatically can tell already with 80% accuracy uh, how aggressive the cancer is. Uh, this was really encouraging, so we wanted to go uh, a step further. Of course, I explained, I explained this really easily, but it's a lot more complex, as you can see here. So if you want to know more about it, you can refer to the paper. Um, so the next step was to see if deep learning could uh, try to reduce the doctor's workload in, this, in also this uh, prostate cancer um, setting. Uh, we started this work as a collaboration with the uh, amazing professor Julia Schnabel, also part of the hybrid network uh, in King's College, London. So since we are trying to do a total automatic pirates in this case, uh, a deep learning approach is, uh, is the, probably the best uh, way that you do it, not just a machine learning than the, in, like in the previous step, but a total uh, deep learning approach. Um, so we want every step to be automatic. And we started with this unit 2D, that this is a basically a segmentation uh, algorithm, a segmentation network, uh, but we can use it in really interesting ways. So this network basically, we feed it with images that you can see in, uh, on the right, on the left here. Um, and then we feed it also with a mask, with segmentation masks. And we tell the machine, can you segment this image? And the machine cannot because he doesn't know anything about your images, but you then feed it with more images, different images from, you can even feed it with different images from uh, a different sequence in a BMR or even with PET images. And we feed it with more images and more images, and we get, you get to the thousands or, or more than thousands, tens of thousands of images. Uh, the machine starts to understand what is behind these segmentations and start to learn how to segment this. But the trick here, the interesting thing, is that as it's learning, it's also learning parameters about the images. So these parameters are going to be hidden in the hidden le uh, layers of this network. In this case, the most hidden layer of this network is called the semantic layer because it has semantic information. Semantic information means basically information about the meaning of things. So it has information about the meaning of the images. So why is it segmenting the images as it is? Uh, what is it uh, finding in these images that is interesting? So we can use that semantic layer uh, as, a, as our features. So or, already with the same network, we already have two of the uh, steps that we need to do, and they are already automatic. And when we already have the features, then we basically need an extra step to do the classification. And with this setting that is also relatively simple, but in a deep learning approach, we have a totally automatic um, classification tool in this case. Uh, and with this uh, really interesting network, uh, we got a 91% in the prediction of the pirate scores in this case, not the, not the Gleason score as, as in the pre previous one, but the pirate score. So you can see that both, most of these uh, important uh, scores that the doctors use uh, in, in prostate cancer station both of them can be relatively well predicted by networks, and we are on our, on our way to make these predictions even better. So is, that, is this all? This, is this all that we can do? Uh, actually, no. Um, this is actually a, a work in progress, so that's why this, there's no publication for this. But as I already explained before, uh, we, uh, we found that magnetic resonance images and um, PET images, in this case, PSMA PET images, uh, have a, an added value. So they can work together to make a better prediction. So in this case, we only train our network with magnetic resonance images, 
we want to see if we add the PET images, can we get even a, a, an even better prediction? Uh, and we are confident that we can, but uh, that's still to be seen. And then the doctors don't like this idea of deep learning because it's a black box. So what we want to do, as uh, these people in Heidelberg already did uh, for, in another project, um, is try to make uh, what, what is called attention maps, a map that will tell you what the network is looking at when it's predicting. So the doctor can see if there is some, if it makes some sense, if it's not something, some prediction that the doctor cannot understand and will never uh, like to have in the clinic. So this way, it would be a more accessible way uh, of our network for the doctors. So they can understand what the network is doing and they can say, all right, I like it or I don't like it. Uh, as usual, these networks are all for support of the doctors and not to replace them. So they have to understand them at, uh, as good as possible so they use it. And that's why uh, these attention maps uh, is also one of our next steps. Uh, and that being said, I will hand the floor to Martin now again for some final words or for question and answers. Uh, but I want to thank my team first because they all helped me and without them I could have, could have done this. Also thank Beatrice for the opportunity and Hybrid because this is an amazing, amazing international project. Thank you very much, um, Esteban, and uh, all the speakers. Uh, it's really exciting to see what's happening in the field of artificial intelligence. And uh, it's clear that the imaging field is taking a leading role in this. Um, so we have a few questions to uh, all the speakers. So if uh, Irene, um, Nicolo, and Esteban, if you can, can share your mic and, and your video again, uh, then I would like to uh, maybe ask Irene, if you're available for a question, um, I know we have been uh, working in the past as well to, uh, in a multidisciplinary setting, setting, let's say, using imaging uh, in other applications. Uh, it was working with industry, we are also some uh, industry partners uh, within uh, the hybrid consortium, of course, which makes it pretty strong. Um, you showed, um, you outlined in your introduction uh, about AI and imaging that we're only at the start and that there's a lot of things happening under the hood that uh, the, the user may not be aware of uh, in, in the end, uh, which is a very powerful thing. Um, in the end, I think when you look at impact to the patient and uh, the, the physicians and the doctors that have to make the, do the clinical decision making, um, they will have to um, be convinced of all these new emerging technologies as well. So, Iran, um, do you think that the clinicians may at some point be overwhelmed by all the new um, options or and is there specific training uh, required or what are your thoughts about that, uh, especially when you think about uh, radiomics, multiomics and all these imaging techniques? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your uh, question, Martin. Uh, I think it depends on the application. For instance, for segmentation, as was nicely illustrated by Esteban, you know, the medical doctors do not actually have to understand exactly the criteria that have been used to find the edges of the prostate, as long as the result uh, seems reasonable, they don't care about the algorithm that is behind. And, and so for these types of application, the, the fact that uh, the, the machine learning approach acts as a black box doesn't matter much. But for other applications, when the goal is to get a prognostic, for instance, or to assess the severity of the disease, then of course, the users, the medical doctors would like to know what, uh, what could explain the fact that uh, uh, the disease was considered as uh, a severe disease or a poor prognostic disease. For these applications, yes, we have to be explained, to be able to explain to the radiologist, to the nuclear medicine physician, and to the oncologist or 
cardiologist or other applications, what in the images or what other clinical or pathological features made the algorithm decide that the prognostic is poor or is good. And, and I think this is where the machine learning methods currently show their limitations. They can produce very powerful algorithm, but often it's very difficult to understand how the decision or how the classification was made. So this is where our efforts and the efforts of the computer scientists should go to try explain the results of this algorithm. And uh, Esteban discussed about this uh, semantic layer that make it possible to understand which features in the images were, were important to make the classification or, or the decision. And this is very important because these semantic layers can be explained. And as it will be necessary to, to understand that to make the algorithm uh, used by the medical doctors to, so that they can trust and understand where the decision uh, comes from. And it's also important to gain knowledge into the biology, which is reflected by the images or into the pathophysiology. We, we, it's not enough to predict well, we would like to understand well. So predicting is one thing, but if we could understand more, it would be even better. So that's why we, we have to find some way to better understand how this algorithm makes their decision or their prediction. Okay, clear. Maybe take that to, uh, to Nicolo's uh, work. You uh, showed that the, the total tumor burden um, can be assessed by a whole uh, body pad. You also mentioned a, a range of molecular tracers that is in development. So there may be um, specific research required. What is your view on um, where the next research should focus on and where AI can have an, uh, especially uh, an impact? Thank you for uh, your question. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, there is a, a variety of uh, tracers in development. And uh, uh, in my view, AI could uh, help physicians really understand uh, closer what is the progression of the disease uh, in terms of uh, anatomical distribution. So um, often uh, uh, physicians have come up with uh, staging criteria, uh, which reflect the review uh, in large studies of the most frequent sites uh, of metastasis and of progression of the disease. Um, but uh, to really conduct these studies at a detailed level, um, I think there is already a lot of work for physicians to look at uh, hundreds of images, uh, annotate them. Uh, they make several studies on, uh, for instance, the number of lymph nodes in involved, the frequency of uh, different metastases in organs. And I think uh, artificial intelligence uh, can really uh, maybe speed up uh, all these measurements. Um, and once all this data is uh, collected also in a um, machine readable way, it could perhaps even be possible to derive models uh, from the data of uh, this progression. Um, so I think it would be really interesting in the future if a uh, physician can really see uh, these techniques as a tool uh, to make more fast measurements, but also uh maybe do more research studies uh using these uh, techniques okay clear well maybe one final question then to uh, esteban uh, you showcased uh, that uh, well painful biopsies can be prevented for prostate cancer uh, research um using uh, non-invasive techniques and especially your uh, your predictive uh, ai methods 
the question is uh, maybe in general, uh, how can we be sure that the, the data generated by the computers are, are correct? Um, well, that's a really, really good question. And um, that's a, an unsolved question uh, in the AI community. But in any case, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, these methods are basically to assist the doctor. So in general, this method will be handed to the doctor and the doctor will just use them and, and get scores from them. And then they, they will also uh, check that the, that the scores are done correctly. For instance, with the PIRA scores, they can do the PIRA themselves. But the problem is that the pirates take anything between 20 minutes and hours and three hours. And with this, this method, you have an automatic pirate in one second. And then you only need to check in two or three minutes if it's correct or not, for instance. So in the case of the prediction of the pirate score, um, it's, it's a tool for the doctor to make it faster. And that's how it, it becomes less cumbersome. In the case of um, biopsy, for instance, that's a, a more tricky question. But it could be, a, for instance, used as a tool, as an extra tool at the beginning of the, of the treatment where you still don't know uh, if it's going to go into a, 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 a biopsy or not, or if it's going to go into a prostatectomy or not. Uh, and you can even avoid entirely a prostatectomy if, if the score is low enough, for instance. Um, and to be sure that the method is working or not, well, there are these uh, attention um, uh, methods that I sh show at the end that we also want to implement. Um, and there are, there are also uh, many other ways that the deep learning community is slowly implementing to, to make uh, AI visible, so to make uh, AI understandable for the doctors. Uh, and I think that's uh, where the research is going to go in the next years, because since particularly myself, I'm interested mostly in translational research, so this is the perfect platform for me. Uh, and translate, clinical translational research is really tricky. Uh, but the first people that you need to convince is the doctors. And if the doctors can see something, that can touch something, uh, they will trust the information. So as uh, I, I have been getting a lot of feedback from different doctors in, in actually different clinics. I worked a little bit in uh, Brest in, in France. I worked a little bit in uh, St. Thomas in, in London and here in the Technical University of Munich in Reza Isa. Uh, and all doctors uh, say more or less the same. If we can see it, then we will trust it. And in, that's why our, my research is going to go probably next year. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think uh, this also nicely resonates with the questions provided by the other speakers, by Irene and Nicolo. And I would like to thank you once more for your uh, excellent contributions. Um, given the time, uh, this also concludes the, the first webinar of the trilogy with Hybrid. Um, so we are looking forward to uh, seeing all of you back next week. Um, that will be February 16th. And, and that will be about advances in molecular imaging. So thank you very all, much for all, and um, have a nice day. <laughs>